Well, you guys, I'm so excited to jump into God's Word together today as we close out our series, Peace on Earth. And we've been talking about peace and really Advent as we kind of went through the Christmas season. And we were looking at what does it mean for there to be peace on earth? How do we access peace on earth? We've had some great times together in God's Word throughout this series. Today, I want to continue it and start with a couple of our theme verses for this series. Luke 2, 14 says, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And of course, that was the angel speaking to the shepherds on the night that Jesus Christ was born. In Isaiah 9, 6, it talks about Jesus coming as the Prince of Peace, as a prophetic foretelling of his coming. And then uh, we've read this uh, quote uh, from Billy Graham, uh, I think every, uh, every part of this series. And he said, the world doesn't give peace. For it doesn't have any peace to give. It fights for peace. It negotiates for peace. It maneuvers for peace. But there is no ultimate peace in the world. But Jesus gives peace to those who put their trust in him. And then last week, as we talked about Christmas and as we met on Christmas Eve morning, we kind of based our time together out of this passage in Matthew 1, uh, 21 through 23. And I'll just read the uh, verse 23 here, but it's telling of Jesus coming to earth. And it says in verse 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we talked about that a lot last week. You can go check that out on all of the media channels and, and listen to that if you weren't able to be with us. But in week three, we talked about Emmanuel, God with us. And today, as we close out this series and we talk about the peace of God and how we access the peace of God and how we carry the peace of God, I want to talk today not just about God with us, although that was the prerequisite for any peace that we're possibly able to have, but today I want to talk to you about this, us with God. So last week we talked about God with us and Jesus coming and, and inserting himself into the human story. And today, as we close out this series about peace, I want to talk to you about us with God which is our part that we do in response to God with us. And I want to talk today about what we need to do in order to continue walking in that peace. And really, this is not just a message out of Scripture, although it is that, but this is actually an invitation. This is an invitation to a new season as we enter into 2024, a season of 21 days of prayer and fasting. This is, I really believe, uh, if I could uh, kind of lean into this spiritually, really a prophetic invitation for you in, in a new season of your life as we enter into 21 days of prayer. And, and uh, as I spoke about in the intro, if you're live streaming with us today, and if you're watching this later and you're just watching this teaching, I will tell you currently you can go to our website and you can find multiple places on our website where you can access the information to sign up for 21 days of prayer right in the main browser bar, a button on the homepage. You can also go to uh, the tile on our app. You can also um, continue to look around our social media and find the way to sign up to receive this information. But I wanna invite you and I want to implore you, I want to challenge you as a pastor, as your pastor for many of you, um, get involved in 21 days of prayer. This is an invitation, I, I believe prophetically, an invitation to a new season for your life. And, and I, I want to talk today not just about God with us, although that's the prerequisite and the part that we could never do, but today I want to talk about us with God, which is the part that we can do in response. And, um, you know, we were soaping this last week, and if you're not soaping with us, you can do that as well. You can go download our app and you can... Uh, click on the, the Bible uh, portion there and you can read the Bible with us. We, re we read one chapter a day and we read the same chapter each day. We're going through a plan right now where we read the Bible in three years, over a three-year period. I think it's three years and three months, actually, we read the Bible together. Uh, you can do that with us. But we were reading in Exodus 35 this last week, and I wanted to read you some of the portion. And there was a phrase that kept jumping out at me. And I, I want to give you some reflection that I had as a pastor and then kind of land it for each and every one of us. But in Exodus 35, uh, God's actually giving instruction to Moses to share with uh, the people. And it says this in verse 4, Exodus 35, 4. It says, Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, or bronze, blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and another of durable leather, uh, acacia wood, olive oil, and on and on. That was verse 8. On and on it goes. All of the things that they would bring in offering. Uh, I could say it like this. That's giving financially. And we know now, all these years later, that um, that we use coins, paper, we use bank transactions uh, as the... Um, the representation of goods that are given. Back here, they were actually giving olive oil or a ram skin. Now we actually give money. But really here in Exodus 35, Moses is talking to them about being willing to give financially to the work of God. 
And then as you continue to read, uh, so we'll call that part giving financially. And then in verse 10, it says this, it says, all who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. Verse 11, the tabernacle with its tents and its coverings, clasps, frames, crossbars, posts, and bases, the ark with its poles and the atonement cover and the curtains that shield it. And it goes on and on for about another 10 verses or so, giving instruction for what they were actually to put their hand to. So we might call this faithfully serving. So the first one we might call like sacrificially giving. And then the second portion here, we might call uh, serving faithfully. So uh, giving financially and then serving faithfully. And so I was really struck by this, that in Exodus 35, Moses is giving God's command to the Israelites to bring offerings financially and also to bring what they have to give and to serve with their hands, to do work with their hands. And then as you continue on in verse 20, it says this, it says, after Moses was done speaking, it says, then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence, that was their leader. And then verse 21, And everyone who was willing and whose heart was moved brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting for all of its service to the Lord uh, for the sacred garments. Verse 22, all who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds. Skip ahead to verse 25. Every skilled woman spun with her own hands and brought what she had spun. It goes on and on, verse 26. And all the women who were willing and had the skill spun the goat hair. The leaders brought onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breastplate, verse 28. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense. And then check this out in verse 29. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. Okay, that was a lot of passage there, but here's what I want you to see. In Exodus 35 that we just read last week in our soap, Moses was bringing a message from God to the people. And what Moses was telling them was, for those who are willing, for those who have a heart for this, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring an offering to the Lord financially, and I want you to actually bring your skills and your service to the Lord. But I want you to do it with a willing heart. And I don't know if you caught that over and over and over again. It says, In verse five, everyone who's willing is to bring to the Lord. And then in verse, uh, let's see, um, verse uh, 21, everyone who was willing and whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord and, and for the work of the tent of meeting. Verse 22, all who were willing, men and women. Uh, uh, Verse 26, and all the women who were willing. Verse uh, 29, all the Israelite men and women who were willing. And so what I want you to see here is that there's this idea that Moses was bringing the word to the Lord and telling the people, look, this is what God wants you to do. God wants you to give financially and he wants you to serve with your hands, with the skills that you have. But you have to be willing. And for the ones who are willing, that's what the Lord is asking for from you. And as a pastor, you know, I kind of stepped back. As I was reading this, I was so struck um, for us at Element Church that God has so much I want to say, God has so much that he wants to do through our community. I believe in so many ways that God is just getting started with us. And it's an interesting thing to say, you know, all these years in, but I really do see the Lord working everywhere still. And I really do have a sense that over the last few years, as we came out of COVID and over 80 Sundays where we didn't meet, that the instruction from the Lord was just put one foot in front of the other. And really, as Pastor Eric and I have been praying and seeking the Lord. And as our team has been doing so as well, we've really sensed that 2024 is going to be a year where God begins to actually give us marching orders again for some new things, maybe some old things in a new way. And so we're very excited about that. But as I was praying through and reading over Exodus 35 last week, I was just struck that the instruction from the Lord was to give financially and to use what has been put in your hand from a skills perspective to serve. But it was only given to those and only called out to those who were willing. And so this question came up in me was, how do we live lives of giving and serving God consistently over time and keep a willing heart? And, you know, as a pastor, I've watched so many people that have kind of jumped into the work of God and they've really, for a season, they've really given and they've really served and they've really thrown themselves in. But they just, over time, they burn out. 
And I've seen other people who really don't ever get involved and really invest themselves financially or with serving and kind of sit on the fringe of what the Lord is doing, what the Lord is building. And I really was struck in my own heart, God, how do we live lives consistently over time as people that give and serve with a willing heart? And, you know, as we read that in Exodus 35, and I was praying through that and processing that, um, I went back up to the, the top of my Bible there in Exodus 35, and it said something very unique. It said, um, Sabbath regulations. And it was really interesting that this whole portion of scripture about how we're to give and to serve with a willing heart is actually set in the context of the Sabbath. It's set in the context of us finding rest in God's presence. And there's a lot to talk about there, um, but uh, just for now, we've talked about this before, but just for now, I'll say this. Sabbath rest in the Old Testament was a type and a shadow of the rest that would come through Jesus Christ, the peace that would come through the presence of Jesus Christ. We actually can read about that in Hebrews chapter 4, where it talks about there was an Old Testament Sabbath rest, but that actually it wasn't complete, and that what we needed is we needed Jesus to come and actually establish that rest in totality and in fullness. And as our high priest, Jesus now actually allows us to enter that rest fully and completely, and now we can actually approach God's throne of grace with confidence and boldness in our time of need. You can read about all of that in, in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 4, that Jesus institutes the rest for God's people. So let me try to bring some of this together. How do we live lives of giving and serving consistently over time with a willing heart? And the answer is by being restored in God's presence. The answer is by encountering Jesus, who is our true rest and our true Sabbath. The answer to what God told the Old Testament Israelites to do, both in giving financially and in serving with the skills that they had, was that they should do so with a willing heart. And that that willing heart was only sustainable by actually engaging in Sabbath rest. And we know now in the New Testament, as New Testament believers, that that rest, that Sabbath rest is actually provided to us through the person of Jesus Christ, our ultimate peace our ultimate rest. And so the answer is that we're restored in God's presence. But I watch, and even in my own life, I execute so many times, but I watch so many people who actually don't live in God's peace and rest, though they're trying to give and they're trying to serve. Pete Scazzaro said this, he said, I define an unhealthy person as one who operates in a continuous state of emotional and spiritual deficit their being with God isn't sufficient to sustain their doing for God. And if there's anything that I could get to you at the end here of this year, and as we look ahead to 21 days of prayer, and we look ahead to a year of 2024, and we look ahead to a year where I really do believe that the Lord is going to begin breathing some fresh faith and some fresh mountains that we're to take. Guys, we've got to learn how that we can give and serve with a willing heart consistently over the long haul. And the, so the question is, how do we do that over time? The question is, to put it in another way, how are we to be at rest and peace with God? And of course, there's a lot of answers to that. Worship, we can attend church together, we can serve and give. But really today, as with the rest of the time that we have, I want to focus on the answer of prayer. Because prayer really is the mechanism by which we actually take our current physical existence and we connect it into the kingdom of God. Prayer is actually a mechanism that we can access into to reach God and to be restored in his presence. It's how we can give and serve with a willing heart over the long haul. As Pete Scazzaro said, that to be a healthy person, we need to not operate in a continuous state of emotional and spiritual deficit. And the way that we do that is by allowing our being with God to sufficiently sustain our doing for God. You know, um, I'll take a step back and just say that for about a decade now, I've been on a personal journey in my own life of really delving into the process of prayer. Um, I remember in 2014, which again, we're, we're entering into 2024 now. So about a decade ago, I just sensed that there was, I was missing something deep about prayer. And, uh, and for years, I uh, just started kind of exploring, I started reading a lot of books about prayer. And, I, and I'm still doing that, by the way. Um, but I started talking to a lot of my mentors and I started pressing in about their prayer lives. And I started asking people I respect about how they spent time with God. And, and, um, and what I kind of came to is that there's obviously a lot of different ways to do that and a lot of different ways that people uh, stepped into the places of prayer. But one of the things I realized is that I needed to learn how to pray. 
and that learning how to pray is something that can be taught, but really it is also something that must be caught. And I know that that sounds very cliche and you've probably heard that before, but it's very true. There's reasons that it's cliche because it's stated over and over and over again. And I wrote this in my notes. I knew how to pray for where I had been, but I did not know how to pray for where I was going. I want to say that one more time. I knew how to pray for where I had been, but I didn't know how to pray for where I was going. And I will tell you that as I can look you in the face right here in this moment, I can tell you that that's as true today as it was for me in 2014. I know how to pray for where I've been, but I sitting here today, I do not know how to pray for where I'm going. And that's a challenge for me. And let me now turn that challenge back to you and tell you this. You know how to pray currently today for where you've been. But for most of you, I believe, maybe for all of you, you do not yet know how to pray for where you're going. Because there is no end to our prayer life and there is no end or depth to to the, the, the recesses that we can go in prayer with God. And so this idea that I know how to pray for where I've been but not for where I'm going is true for me still today and it is true for you still today as well. And my conclusion as I've come through all these years of seeking and processing with prayer is that we can't just come to a mental ascent to the importance of prayer. That we actually have to work on the academic teaching, we have to be taught to pray, but we also have to catch prayer. We have to desire prayer. We have to want to pray, if I could say it that way. And that actually learning to pray for where we're heading is as much about wanting to pray and working on that mechanism in our life as it is knowing how to pray. But we've got to do both. And I I think that, you know, those things are very important. I believe if we want to pray more, we have to learn how to pray more. And in order to learn how to pray more, we have to actually pray more. Now say, okay, what does that mean? Well, uh, from a from a community side, we do 21 days of prayer twice a year. And the reason we do that is because we actually want to create, a, again, I'm using the word mechanism a lot today, but we want to create a mechanism by which you guys and, and me too can learn to pray in a new way and desire to pray in a new way. But I'll kind of uh, extend that into a personal thing here uh, for you and for me. And to say this, I'll ask you another question. Do you like to do things that you don't know how to do? And the answer to that is probably no. So then it stands to reason that if we're going to like to pray and we're going to want to pray, we're going to need to learn how to pray. I remember, uh, I'll give you a practical example. I remember when I moved up here uh, from Texas by way of New York State, um, I got here in eighth grade and I I remember I went on a trip. It was a school trip and um, I learned to play Euchre and Euchre is a, a Michigan game. It's like a Northern game. And I had never even heard it. First of all, it's a weird word. Euchre. What is that? I, I don't actually still know what that means. It's a weird word to say. It's an even weirder word to spell. Do you even know how to spell Euchre? You probably don't even know how to spell Euchre. You probably play it. You don't even know how to spell it. I didn't, I didn't, I was trying to spell it for my notes and Google had to like correct it. Right. You know, you guys know, sometimes you just try to get close enough that Google knows how to spell it. Um, Euchre is one of those words. You might not even get close enough to know how to spell it. No, it doesn't start with a Y. It starts with an E-U. So I know. And then you go, okay, well, what's next? Right, C-H-R-E, not E-R-R-E, Euchre. It doesn't even make any sense. Okay, but there's my rant on spelling Euchre. But here's the point. I learned to play Euchre when I moved to Michigan. And you know, when I was in Texas, I wasn't passionate about Euchre. Didn't know anything about it. Had never played it before. Didn't know how to spell it then. Still don't know how to spell it now. But I didn't know about Euchre because I had never played it before. And when I started learning to play Euchre, I actually started liking it. And you know what's cool? When I was in high school, my family, my uh, my mom and dad and my two siblings, there was five of us, we would actually eat dinner together and then we would actually play Euchre to clean up the kitchen. So what we would do is we would have four people play Euchre at the table and the spare person would clean the kitchen. And then the two that lost, we would rotate, right? And then the person in the kitchen came and sat down and the, per- the next person up on the losing twosome went to clean the kitchen and we would rotate that until the kitchen was clean, which meant you never had to clean for more than about three minutes because we didn't play up to 10 and then switch. We played every hand we would switch. And it was amazing because it made cleaning the kitchen fun. And so there was this uh, time where I learned to do that. And then, you know, it's interesting because we have a family of five now, Pastor Erica and me and our three kids. And we actually do that uh, at times to clean the kitchen after family dinners for us. And we had a dinner last week with my parents. There was eight of us and we played this, uh, we did Euchre and we had eight of us. And so three were in the kitchen and the rest were playing Euchre and you get the point, but I love Euchre and Euchre. I not only like to play Euchre for cards, but I actually, it helps me enjoy cleaning the kitchen. 
And it actually helps all of the other people enjoy cleaning the kitchen too. And it's really fascinating that when I lived in Texas, I didn't care about Euchre, didn't know about Euchre, didn't know how to spell Euchre, still don't. But now I love Euchre. And Euchre not only is a fun game to play, that I know how to play it, it's actually a game that's brought our families together. It's actually a game that actually has allowed us to enjoy cleaning the kitchen together. And it's become a tradition in our family dinners and in our holiday dinners. And that is really, really cool because when I learned about Euchre and I learned to play, I actually learned to love it. And you know, the last decade has been kind of a personal prayer in or a personal journey in prayer for me like that. I didn't know how to play Euchre before and now it's a part of who I am. And you know, it's interesting in prayer, I didn't know how to do it before, and now it's a part of who I am. And how did that happen? Well, first, I had to learn about it. Second, I had to start playing it. Third, it started to integrate and work its way into my experiences and into my family experiences and into my traditions and into my habits. And, you know, you go, that's a silly example, euchre and prayer, but it does make sense. And I hope you get it. And here's the last thing I'll say on that. I still don't know how to spell euchre, and there's still so many things I don't know about prayer, but it doesn't mean we haven't learned anything. And I do know this, in order to want to pray, in order to desire to pray, in order to be more effective at prayer, we need to know how to pray and we need to want to pray. Some of uh, my friends and people around me and even myself at times will say something like this, "I, I don't want to pray, it feels like a lot of work. And let me say this, Prayer can be work for sure. It is a discipline and it can be a work, but it's the right kind of work. And let me add this in. When our hearts tell us, I don't want to pray, I don't want to be with God, it feels like work. There's a lie in there somewhere. There's some misunderstanding in there about what God is like and what he's asking of us in the place of prayer. Because prayer is what you're actually made for. And prayer is actually, if if like you, Kerr, understood and played, done well, done efficiently, done consistently. Prayer is actually the greatest joy of our life. And so I want to remind you and challenge you with this. Prayer is the greatest potential joy of your life. And if it isn't, you have a lot of work to do in the place of prayer. Because prayer is a work that leads to rest. In Hebrews 4, which I referenced earlier, it said this. It said in verse 9, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Verse 10, for anybody who enters God's rest also enters from their work, just as God did from his. Verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that none of us will perish following the example of disobedience. Wait a sec. You said in Hebrews, God, you said that if we are going to Sabbath rest, we have to cease from our work, just just like God did from his. But then you said, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. How does making an effort to enter rest work? Other translations say labor to enter into rest. There is a kind of work that we work, but it isn't the same kind of work as before. It is an intentionality and a discipline. It's the right kind of work to enter into rest. And that's what prayer is for us. John 15, one through five. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because the word I've spoken to you remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And then check this out. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So prayer is the way in which we stay in step with God. Now, of course, we understand that salvation and connection with God was done through Jesus Christ. I can't work for that. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about peace. I'm talking about rest. I'm talking about experiencing the kingdom of God within our life. Galatians 5.25 says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And prayer is the work by which we stay connected to the vine. We stay in step with the Spirit. We enter into the true rest. We experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. If you remember the scripture, we've shared it in this in this uh, series in the month of December. It says this, be anxious about nothing, but in everything with prayer 
and supplication and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And then what? And the peace that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. There it is, you guys. Prayer is the mechanism by which it's not only that Jesus came to earth, Emmanuel, God with us, it's actually prayer is us with God. It's our response. It's our work back. It's not a, a, a labor in, in, in the sense of all the other kind of labor, but it is a labor, but it's a labor that enters into rest. It is a labor to stay connected to the vine. It's the labor of prayer. And uh, as our time is growing short, I want to um, give you three truths on prayer uh, from one of my mentors from afar, Pastor John Eldridge. And he says this, if we're going to understand prayer, he says we need to understand three things. And I'm going to move through these rather quickly, but he says, number one, you need to understand that, that God is growing us up. That the whole, uh, well, I'll talk about this in just a second. I'll just give them to you and then we'll talk about them. Number one, God is growing us up. Number two, we are in a great war for the souls of human beings. Number three, the point of prayer is union with God. Number one, God is growing us up. Uh, do you know that our whole life is actually not about being moved into successive layers and degrees of comfort, but that our life in the kingdom of God is to move through, uh, through excessive degrees and uh, various levels of uh, growth. It is God growing us up. It is God working in us, yes, for salvation, but really for sanctification, that we're becoming more and more like the person of Jesus, that we're becoming more and more like God, that we're growing and maturing uh, as human beings, as the human beings that God created and intended. C.S. Lewis has a quote on this. He says this, he says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. And you knew that these jobs needed doing. And so you're not surprised. Now, I'll pause for a second. This might be, you know, the thing that brings us to Jesus, you know, our addiction. This might be the thing that brings us to Jesus, uh, that traumatic experience. It might be the thing that brings us to Jesus, right? Our uh, realization that we're not self-sufficient uh, and we need God in our life. Okay, but C.S. Lewis continues. And, well, by the way, and we're good with that. And that's what C.S. Lewis is talking about here. He says he's, he's fixing the roof that's leaking, but you already knew that, C.S. Lewis says. Here's what he says. He says, uh, fix, fixing the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that these jobs needed doing, and so you are not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts uh, abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation that he's building out quite a different house than the one you thought of. Throwing out uh, a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. And I love that quote from C.S. Lewis because what it reminds us is that God is not making us into a nice little comfortable cottage. That God is actually moving in, creating a palace in which he intends to dwell. And I don't have time to teach all of it today, but I've taught it in the past. I'm sure we'll touch it again in the future. But you are now the temple of the living God. That God dwells in you. And he is making a palace in which he is quite at home. And this is actually the truth about our life with God is that God is growing us up. And if we don't understand that prayer will never make sense to us because we'll be praying for things that, uh, and getting answers that make no sense because God is not just trying to bring us into comfort. Now that doesn't mean that God can't bring us into comfort or that he doesn't desire for us to experience good things, but it means that God primarily is growing us up. And what is the mechanism for God growing us up? Well, C.S. Lewis said it's him knocking things about. Or in another way, allowing us to be knocked about. And then, and then prayer is us sitting with God in those places where he is knocking down walls, running up towers, and building courtyards. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17 says this, Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What it means, what Paul's writing to the church of Corinth is he says this, look, don't lose heart. Don't you understand that what God is doing is he's actually growing you up. That all of these things that you look around and say, I'm wasting away, but you're being renewed on the inside day in, day out. That these light and momentary troubles that we face in this world are actually achieving for us. They are working within us. They are producing within us 
and eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I'll close this little point here with this is to say, sometimes we pray uh, and we think about the couch at home. Uh, by way of analogy, we say, God, could you make this relationship in my life better? God, could you get me this better job? God, could you bring some more finances? God, could you make this area that's troublesome in my life go away? God, could you just step in and just fix everything and just, just make everything perfect? That's the prayer that I want to pray. And by the way, God's good if you pray those prayers. I don't think he has a problem with that. But we get disillusioned when we expect God to make our Christian life like a comfortable couch. And what I'd like to do is transition your mindset and prayer from a comfortable couch to actually a gym. Because when you go to a gym, and it's, you know, us entering to 2024, many of us will have New Year's resolutions of working out. And when we go into a gym, here's what we know. We expect a trainer to kick our butts. We don't expect the trainer to say to us, hey, you know, you look like you need a break. Why don't you go sit on the couch? We don't expect the trainer to say, could I bring you some chips and a beverage? Why don't you watch the game? We expect the trainer to push us to our limits. And we expect the trainer to challenge us, to encourage us, to bend our thinking beyond where it's been before, to press our physical limits past where we thought they could go. And it's not only does it not make us upset, angry, or mad, it's actually the reason we came and spent the money. And what I want you to do as we think about prayer and we think about life with God is to stop thinking about God as this eternal vending machine in the sky that brings you comfort and peace, although God does bring comfort and peace, but to remember that God is growing us up. And if we don't understand that, Pastor John Eldridge says prayer will never make sense. And I will add, and we will never want to pray because it will be like a card game we just simply don't understand. And we typically don't like to play card games we don't understand. The second thing that John Eldridge said about prayer is that we're in a great war for the souls of human beings. And as Christians, we believe that. We just finished a series this last fall, Elohim, and we understand that we are in a cosmic war, that there's a spiritual realm and a physical realm, and we are living at the intersection of those, and that there is a great war for the souls of human beings. If we just go just to last week where we talk about the Christmas story, and we talk about Jesus being born at Christmas, and we talk about mangers and animals and a cute baby, and we sing Silent Night, which we did with Candlelight, and it was beautiful. But if you keep reading the Christmas story, what you have next is you have three wise men that show up and give gifts. And then you have angels showing up in a dream to Joseph, telling him to flee to Egypt. Why? Because Herod is slaughtering all the babies around the area of Bethlehem under the age of two. Why? How do we get from animals and mangers and silent night to Herod slaughtering innocent babies. And that only makes sense. The only reason that we can figure out what's going on here is if there is a war happening in the spiritual realm that actually finds its way into the physical realm. And that's what we believe happens at the Christmas season. That's what we believe happens around the life of Jesus. But it's really interesting because we like to think of Jesus as born in a manger, baby animals, uh, babies, animals, silent night, and we forget Herod slaughtering babies because there is a war for the human soul. In Daniel 10, Daniel prays in the Old Testament and he prays and seemingly nothing happens. And 21 days later, an angel shows up and says this to Daniel. In Daniel 10, I came the day you prayed. The day you prayed, I left heaven. But the prince of Persia resisted me for 21 days. What was he saying? He said, I left heaven the day you prayed. And for 21 days, I was in a a spiritual war in order to get here to you. God answered the first day the prayer was prayed, but the answer was delayed because of the way things work in the spiritual realm. Now, I am not trying to paint a perfect theology with that one scripture, but here's what I'm saying. It's too simplistic to say, well, I prayed and God didn't answer. Or I prayed that once and it didn't make any difference. Or prayer doesn't really seem to matter. Or I pray and it doesn't seem like God hears me. Those are way too simplistic things to say. It's also too simplistic to say, I don't really need to pray. I'm self-sufficient. I can figure it out. Look, if you look at my physical surroundings, I got everything under control. No, there's a war for the souls of human beings that's happening in the invisible realm. We are caught up in a collision of kingdoms. And we have to remember that or we will not want to pray and we will not go to the place of prayer. We have to come to grips with the partial reality of the already and the not yet, as theologians say. 
Jesus has done everything already, and yet it's not fully fulfilled. <clears throat> we are living in a place, it's like a seed planted that is growing up. It's not yet come to fruition, and yet the seed has been planted and everything that needs to be done has been done. And that speaks of my life and my experience with God. And it also speaks of our world and the restoration that is coming through the person of Jesus on earth as it is in heaven. So a point two here, I'll ask you this question. The fact that God's growing us up and that we're in a cosmic battle for the souls of humanity, does that change the shape and the way we pray and interpret our prayers? And I would say, absolutely. And Pastor John Eldridge says, unless you understand this, you will never understand prayer. My friend Rich Reynolds says this, he says, prayer is the opposite of control, even though many people try to pray in order to grab control. Now listen, prayer is the opportunity to find peace in the Prince of Peace and to find that presence of peace in the middle of the wars that we face every day. It is not the ability to control and manipulate everything in our life to bring us to a place of comfort because God is growing us up and we're in a soul for the, we are in a war for the souls of humanity. And I will remind us that prayer is the mechanism of God's peace. And that leads us to point three, is that the point of prayer is union with God. And as we move into January and we move into 21 days of prayer, I'm going to do more teaching on prayer as we move, specifically a mentor from afar of mine, Pete Gregg, who wrote a book um, on prayer and the acronym PRAY is to pause, to rejoice, to ask, and to yield. And we'll talk about that over the next several weeks. And we'll walk it out experientially in 21 days of prayer. But I do want to close with this idea is that the point of prayer is union with God. Beth Moore said this. She said, trying to know God and serve him before we come to love him is exhausting. I'll say that again. Trying to know God and serve him before we come to love him is exhausting. And prayer is the mechanism by which we learn to fall in love with God. Kingsley Manuel said this, the most important part of prayer is not the result it produces, but the intimacy it creates. I'll read that one more time. The most important part of prayer is not the result it produces, but the intimacy it creates. Because God is growing us up. We are in a war for the souls of humanity. And the point of prayer is union with God. And just like Euchre, maybe not exactly like, but just like Euchre, you've got to learn about prayer in order to want to pray. And then you've actually got to pray in order to integrate that into your life so that you can enjoy doing it. So how do we find peace with God? How do we close out 2023 and move into 2024, a year of faith, in peace? How do we find the Prince of Peace? How do we walk with the Prince of Peace? How do we stay connected to the vine? How do we stay in step with the Spirit? The answer is prayer. God with us, but us with God. And how do we live lives of giving and serving consistently over time with a willing heart? Prayer. And you guys, I'm not only teaching that from the Bible today, I am as your pastor inviting you, imploring you, begging you, to invest the first three weeks of your year in specific prayer with God. And we've created a way for you to do that. It's on our website in the main browser bar. You can sign up. It's on a button on our main homepage. You can sign up. It's on the app, main uh, tile. You can sign up. And we sent out an email this week to 500 people in our database with a sign up. It's there. We've done everything that we can do to lead you to the place where you can engage God in a new season of prayer because I bet you, you know how to pray for where you've been but you don't know how to pray for where God wants to take you next. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you for the gift of prayer. God, we thank you that we just celebrated at Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us, that you came. But God, I pray now that you would allow us to respond with passion, with fervor, with discipline. And God, that we would actually pursue you, us with God. And I pray that over us in a fresh season. God, we know how to pray for for where we've been and how we're here. But God, would you teach us to pray for a new season for where you want to take us next? God, I pray for anyone within the sound of my voice that doesn't have a relationship with you. If they want to start one with you, I'll lead them in this prayer right at this moment. You can pray this with me to say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that you did come and you gave your life for me on the cross. You paid for my sin and you invited me into relationship with God. I'll receive that gift right now. I confess, Jesus, that I need a Savior. 
and I confess that you are my Savior and my Lord. Come in and have every piece of my life. Lead me and guide me. I want to walk with you, the Prince of Peace. Thank you for teaching me to pray, teaching me to talk to you, teaching me to listen to you, and teaching me to stay in step with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And let me pray for the rest of us. God, as we enter into a time of worship, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you impress upon us the need, the, in, the intense the intense need. And God, would you stir up within us a fresh desire to pray? Because we know, God, that we can't serve you. We can't give to you. We can't serve or give to those around us. We can't even be healthy people without being in your presence. And I pray, God, that you would impress on us for a new season, a new need, and a fresh desire to engage you in the place of prayer. Holy Spirit, would you speak to every heart in an individual way, God, as we go into a time of prayer about what they need to hear from you in regards to what was shared today. And then, God, I pray that you would unction us, remind us, impress us, burden us to pray as we enter into 2024. God, would you, would you burden us, God, to seek your face? Because, God, we know that there is no other place of peace for us. We pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen.